This is the August 4, 2021 County of Santa Clara press briefing relating to the Reed Hillview Airport Airborne Lead Study, 1.30 p.m. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leticia Gomez. I'm the Director of Communications and Public Affairs at the County of Santa Clara. Thanks for joining us for a press briefing on the Reed Hillview Airport Airborne Lead Study. After we hear from the author of the study, a pediatrician, and the deputy county executive who coordinated this project, you will have a chance to ask questions. You must submit your questions electronically using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Again, we'll answer questions after the briefing. Let me introduce Silvia Gallegos. She's a deputy county executive who coordinated this study. Silvia. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, before I introduce the two um, scientists, I wanted to take a moment to explain the background on this study. Back in December 2018, our County Board of Supervisors considered an airport's business plan update. And at that time, our supervisor, Cindy Chavez, and supported by former supervisor, Dave Cortese, made a series of recommendations that the board approved, including starting a visioning process for a possible reuse of Reed Hillview Airport, and also to have uh, the county stop accepting FAA grants that would obligate us to continue keeping the airport open. And importantly, for today's purposes, uh, one of the referrals was to have us undertake a study so that we could learn whether operations at Reed Hillview Airport were contributing to blood lead in children and families around the airport. And so now what I'd like to do is introduce the two um, scientists. So the first one is Dr. Sami Zaran, and he is the principal author of the study that um, is now available to the public. He's a professor of demography and an associate chair in the Department of Economics at Colorado State University. And he holds a joint appointment at, um, in the Department of Epidemiology at the Colorado School of Public Health. And importantly, um, back in 2017, Dr. Zaran uh, did uh, prepare a study that um, was um, illustrating the effect of lead-based aviation gasoline on blood lead levels in children in 448 airports in Michigan. And um, it related to a million children. And we learned of this study and this is what um, caused us to reach out to him. The second researcher is Dr. Bruce Lanfear. He is a public health physician and a pediatric epidemiologist specializing in environmental exposures, including lead. Um, he is currently a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, and he's a clinician scientist at the Children's Hospital Research Institute of the University of British Columbia. Dr. Lanfear's work focuses on the impacts of fetal and early childhood exposure to environmental toxic chemicals, and he's published many, many studies relating to the effects of exposure of lead in, in childhood. And I wanted just to help you understand that Dr. Zaran's role is to explain and, and show you the conclusions that in fact, controlling for other sources of lead, that our airport in fact is contributing to blood lead in children around the airport. Dr. Bruce Lanfear's role is to help us make sense of the study findings. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Zaran. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and can you all see? We can see it. Okay, excellent. So, um, what follows is an abbreviated summary of what we report in the manuscript and to the maximum extent possible. We've tried to make this non-technical um, so that uh, people can 
uh, follow along and discern uh, what we've discovered. Um, I'm going to jump right in with some basic background on the problem of lead exposure and the evidence that's been amassed in the scientific community. While knowledge of the toxic effects of lead stretch back millennia, the evidence amassed by modern science indicates that children exposed to lead suffer substantial, long-lasting, and possibly irreversible negative health, behavioral, and cognitive outcomes. Numerous studies have linked elevated blood lead levels in children to cognitive and intellectual impairments, poor academic achievement, and higher risk of attention deficit and hyperactivity disorders, among other things. Importantly, the relationship between child cognitive ability and blood lead is nonlinear. By that we mean the measured loss in cognitive ability is steeper at lower blood lead levels. Consider the following graphics. Graphic A is from a published study by Dr. Lamphere et al. illustrating the notion that the loss in intellectual ability is steeper at lower blood lead levels. Along the horizontal axis, we have child blood lead levels measured in micrograms per deciliter. On the vertical axis, we have child IQ, an imperfect but widely used indicator of cognitive ability. Note how the addition of one microgram of lead produces different and greater loss in measured ability at lower as opposed to higher blood lead levels. This loss in ability from exposure to lead in early childhood echoes through a child's academic life. Consider graphic B from a published study by Miranda et al. linking child blood lead levels at age two to performance on standardized tests in fourth grade. Again, we see the signature nonlinear effects of lead exposure. The loss in academic performance is steeper at lower blood lead levels in both reading comprehension and mathematics. Studies by scientists like Dr. Lamphere and Dr. Miranda have caused various health organizations to conclude that there is no safe level of lead in a child's body. I quote, even low levels of lead in blood have been shown to affect IQ, ability to pay attention, and academic achievement. The Federal Aviation Administration states it differently. All forms of lead are toxic if inhaled or ingested. Lead can affect human health in several ways, including effects on the nervous system, red blood cells, and cardiovascular and immune systems. Infants and young children are especially sensitive to low levels of lead. Now, it might be tempting to assume that lead exposure in the United States is a rear view or legacy problem. After all, the blood lead levels of children in the United States have declined substantially in the last four decades, coincident with a series of regulatory actions that expelled lead from paint, plumbing, food cans, and automotive gasoline. Most effective among these interventions was the phase out of tetraethyl lead from automotive gasoline induced by provisions of the Clean Air Act. While tetraethyl lead is no longer used as an additive in automotive gasoline, it remains a constituent in aviation gasoline used by an estimated 170,000 piston engine aircraft. These aircraft consume tens of millions of gallons of lead formulated gasoline annually with lead emissions from this consumption accounting for about half 
to two thirds of all lead emissions in the United States today. It is the predominant source. The deposition of lead from these aircraft may be an exposure risk to an estimated 16 million persons residing within one kilometer of 20,000 airports that service these aircraft. While many studies have linked aviation gasoline used to elevated atmospheric lead lead levels in the vicinity of airports to date, only two studies have explicitly linked aviation gasoline use to the blood lead levels of children. In a study involving 125,000 observations across six counties and 66 airports in North Carolina, Miranda et al. reported a striking correlation between child blood lead levels and airport proximity, finding that children at 500 meters and 1,000 meters from the airport presenting with greatest risk of elevated blood lead levels. In a study invo involving over a million children and 448 airports, a study that I published with colleagues of mine found the child blood lead levels increased with proximity to airports increased with piston engine aircraft traffic observed across a subset of these airports, increased in the percentage of prevailing wind days that drifted in the direction of the child's residence, and importantly, declined measurably among children sampled in the months after the tragic events of 9-11, where the flights of these planes were restricted. Mountain Data Group and affiliated scientists were asked to assess whether blood lead levels of sampled children are statistically associated with exposure to lead from aviation related sources, independent of other sources of lead. Specifically, we set out to test whether the blood lead samples of children near Reed Hillview and San Martin airports are correlated with child residential proximity, child residential direction or near angle, and the quantity of piston engine aircraft traffic. What follows is a presentation of results pertaining to Reed Hillview. Only 68 blood samples were taken from children proximate to San Martin Airport in the last 10 years, prohibiting credible statistical analysis. Next, we'll describe the various data sources deployed in the study, as well as the various measurement decisions made to capture exposure risk to lead formulated gasoline. Blood lead sample data are from the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Branch of the Colorado, of, excuse me, of the California Department of Public Health. Blood lead samples are typically collected from children during regular visits to a healthcare provider. Laboratories send this information to the lead poisoning prevention branch. We queried various databases for an indication of residence in Santa Clara County, a date of blood draw occurring within the last 10 years, a date of birth on the sampled person, and a reported blood lead level. Restricting to children 18 years of age and under at the time of draw, residing within a half, one and a half miles of Reed Hillview Airport and observed between January 1st of 2011 to December 31st, 2020, we arrived at 17,241 blood lead sample observations amenable to statistical analysis. The main outcome variable of analytic interest is blood lead level measured in micrograms per deciliter of blood. Among children satisfying our inclusion criteria, the average blood lead level was 1.83 micrograms per deciliter, about 1.7 and 3.2% to sample children present with blood lead levels in excess of 4.5 and 3.5 micrograms respectively. For context, our pre-industrial ancestors had blood lead levels in the range of 0.16 micrograms per deciliter, more than 100 fold lower than a typical child 
around Reed Hillview. Given that the bulk of lead emissions are released during departure phases of the landing takeoff cycle, we capture child proximity by calculating the distance from the child's residence at the date of draw to the northwest tip of Reed Hillview. As with previous research, we analyze this residential distance effect continuously and by division into three risk orbits, less than a half mile, a half mile to a mile, and one to 1.5 miles from Reed Hillview. Now, insofar as avgas exposure is a genuine source of risk, then children residing closer to the airport should present with higher blood lead levels, all things held equal. This figure illustrates the measurement logic. Over our 10 year window, we observe about a thousand children in that inner orbit as indicated in yellow. About 6,500 blood lead samples from a half mile to a mile and about 9,700 blood lead samples in the outer orbit indicated in light blue. Now the fate and transport of lead emissions depends on the direction of prevailing winds. So two children of equal distance to the airport face different risk of elevated blood lead levels depending on the child's residential near angle to the airport. We assigned each sampled child a near angle to Reed Hillview corresponding to the four cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. In this radial plot, we summarize the behavior of wind at Reed Hillview Airport over the last 10 years. Each wedge displays the percentage of wind days that emanate from a defined direction. Here we see that the winds originate overwhelmingly from the northwest and west. In total, we observe about 6,000 children residing north of Reed Hillview, about 1,200 ch children residing east of Reed Hillview, about 3,500 children south, and about 6,500 children west of the airport. Now, insofar as AVGAS exposure is a genuine source of risk, then children residing east of the airport should present with higher blood lead levels. The volume of traffic varies meaningfully between airports and within an airport in time. Therefore, two children residing in the same household, but sampled at different moments in the calendar year may present with different blood lead levels coincident with the volume of piston engine aircraft traffic. To capture this risk, we collected daily data on all piston engine aircraft departures and arrivals from the Federal Aviation Administration and monthly quantities of aviation gasoline sold to fixed base operators at RHV. To give you an appreciation of the quantity of lead released, between January 2011 December 2018, 2.3 million gallons of lead formulated gasoline was sold at RHV. At 2.22, sorry, 2.12 grams of lead per gallon, that's over 10,000 pounds of lead consumed. Based on an EPA estimate, the 95% of lead consumed is emitted over this eight year period, about five metric tons of lead was emitted at Reed Hillview. Importantly, these figures do not include aircraft landing at Reed Hillview that fueled elsewhere. In addition to child proximity to lead emitting toxic release inventory facilities, and residents in neighborhoods with higher risk of exposure to lead-based paint, we control for many variables that are correlated with child blood lead levels. By combining all of these factors, 
in a single statistical equation, we estimate the independent statistical associations between our main indicators of avgas exposure risk and child blood lead levels. In the presentation of our basic results, I'll start with the residential distance effect, then we'll move to the residential near angle, then measures of piston engine aircraft traffic and aviation gasoline sales. Holding all other factors constant, we find that the blood lead levels of children in the nearest orbit are about a fifth of a microgram higher than children in outer orbits. In percentage terms, sample children most proximate to the airport present with blood lead levels that are about 10% higher than sample children in outer orbits. To provide context, this calculated difference of a fifth of a microgram is approximately equal to 50% of the estimated increase in child blood lead levels at the height of the Flint water crisis over baseline levels in Flint. We know this to be true because we conducted and published an NIH study analyzing over 21,000 blood lead levels in Genesee County before, during, and after the Flint water crisis. It is an imperfect comparison with respect to the nature of the exposure. In one case, we have contaminated water entering a home. In the Reed Hillview case, we have atmospheric deposition of the toxicant. However, it is worth noting that the Flint water crisis from start to finish unfolded in less than a year and a half. By contrast, at Reed Hillview, the release of lead into the lived environment is continuous, a daily unabated stream of an undeniably harmful toxicant. Next, I'll share results pertaining to near angle. Again, controlling for other factors and compatible with a hypothesis of avgas exposure risk, we find that children residing east of the airport present with blood lead levels that are significantly higher than all other sampled children. Residing east of Reed Hillview is associated with a 0.4 microgram per deciliter increase in blood lead levels, equal to a 25% increase over all other sample children. This margin of difference is equal to the observed difference in sample children before and during the Flint water crisis. Next, we'll share results pertaining to piston engine aircraft traffic. This figure summarizes how child blood lead levels change with an increase in piston engine aircraft traffic. Again, accounting for all other factors, the upward sloping line here indicates the child blood lead levels increase as the quantity of piston engine aircraft increases. This result is supported by a substitution of this indicator of traffic for the quantity of aviation gasoline sold. Again, we see the signature upward sloping relationship as the quantity of aviation gasoline sold at the airport increases, so too do the blood lead levels of children. In going from the minimum to the maximum of child piston engine aircraft exposure, we find the child blood lead levels increase by about 0.3 micrograms per deciliter. This result obtains if we substitute P traffic for the quantity of avgas sold. And this relationship is likely linear as supported by analyses involving the division of traffic into low, medium, and high categories. Now, in addition to our basic results, we perform several ancillary tests to extend and support the body of evidence. 
I'm going to walk you through three of these uh, uh, analyses, uh, but uh, I'm happy to share with you analyses performed on these other two. The first extension involves categorical measurement of blood lead levels to see if exposure risk to aviation gasoline increases the likelihood that a sample child presents with blood lead levels in excess of 4.5 micrograms per deciliter, which is a high threshold that the CDPH uses to allocate scarce resources toward the protection of the most vulnerable children. We display two sets of results here, but we're gonna focus on the series of panels on the right-hand side pertaining to the probability of exceeding 4.5 micrograms. Fixing your eyes on the navy blue graphics, we find in the top right-hand panel, the children in the outer orbit of one to 1.5 miles present with very high blood lead levels, that risk of presenting with blood levels in excess of 4.5 is 22% lower than statistically similar children residing near the airport. Children east of Reed Hillview are remarkably 2.37 times more likely to present with blood lead levels greater than 4.5 micrograms than children residing north of the airport. Finally, we find that the risk of exceedance increases substantially if a child is exposed to the maximum as opposed to the minimum quantity of traffic. Next, we present results from a test that may be regarded as the most powerful of the tests performed. In this test, we ask whether the blood lead levels of children respond differently to fluctuations in traffic depending on their proximity to the airport. Let us move a bit slower here. On the horizontal axis, we have the quantity of piston engine aircraft traffic going from the observed minimum to the maximum. On the vertical axis, we have predicted blood lead levels holding all other factors constant. Two lines intersect the space. One corresponding to children within a half mile of the airport. The other corresponding to children at a half mile to 1.5 miles. To use the language of medicine, we can think of children in the nearest orbit as our treatment group and children in the outer orbit as our control group. Now imagine that we turn a dial in traffic from low to high. Note how the blood lead levels of sample children in our so-called treatment group, those children in the inner orbit of risk, rise steeply in response to piston engine aircraft traffic. Also note that the blood lead levels of children in the outer orbit also increase, but modestly so. This result again obtains if we substitute traffic for the quantity of aviation gasoline sold. Overall, among sample children at less than a half mile from Reed Hillview, an increase from the minimum to the maximum is associated with an estimated 0.83 microgram increase in blood lead levels. Children nearest to the airport are especially sensitive to changes in traffic. Results from various efforts to limit the spread of COVID-19 produced a significant decline in piston engine aircraft traffic at Reed Hillview. Over the months of February to July 2020, traffic declined by 
to 44%, depending on the baseline used. Intriguingly, traffic at Reed Hillview returned to pre-pandemic levels in August to December. These dynamics in piston engine aircraft operations at the airport present us with a natural experiment. Insofar as aviation gasoline exposure is a genuine source of risk, then children sampled in this contraction moment should present with lower blood lead levels. Children sampled in this contraction period, in fact, presented with significantly lower blood lead levels, about a fourth of a microgram lower than children not sampled in this contraction window. The size of the observed retreat in the blood lead levels of children are on par or approximately equal in magnitude to what we observe in main analyses pertaining to piston engine aircraft traffic. This is basically a recapitulation of what I covered. And now a summary of the evidence. The evidence from main analyses for a statistical link between aviation gasoline, exposure risk and child blood lead levels include the blood lead levels of sampled children increase significantly with proximity to the airport. The blood lead levels are significantly higher among children residing east and predominantly downwind of Reed Hillview and increase in the downwind days from the date of blood draw. The blood lead levels of sample children increase significantly with piston engine aircraft traffic at the airport and monthly quantities of aviation gasoline sold at the airport. The blood lead levels and the traffic fluctuate together in time. Evidence for a statistical link between child blood lead levels and aviation gasoline exposure from extended analyses include the probability that blood lead levels exceed four and a half micrograms increases with proximity to the airport, residing east of the airport, and fluctuate with traffic. The blood lead levels of children proximate to Reed Hillview are significantly more sensitive to fluctuations in traffic and quantities of avgas sold. The blood lead levels of children sampled in the contraction moment corresponding to the non-pharmaceutical interventions by the county to limit the spread of COVID-19, those children presented with significantly lower blood lead levels. On the need to limit lead exposure from aviation gasoline, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine maintains. Because lead does not appear to exhibit a minimum concentration in blood, which there is no health effects, there is compelling reason to reduce or limit eliminate aviation lead emissions. The evidence compiled in this study, the ensemble of it, supports the compelling need to limit aviation lead emissions to safeguard the welfare and life chances of at-risk children. Thank you. So let's invite Dr. Lanfear to speak um, more in layperson terms, in terms of what we can make of these findings. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, and thank you, Sammy. My, my comments are gonna be quite brief. What I really wanted to do is just provide some perspective on, on this study um, of childhood lead exposure from the Reed Hillview Airport. As Sylvia said, I'm, I'm a physician, a public health physician and a scientist. And over the, over the past 25 years, uh, I've been studying how uh, lead damages children and adults. And also I studied how children are poisoned by lead and paint, air, house dust and water. That is, I've, uh, I've quantified how different sources impact children's blood lead levels. 
So we've known, as Sammy said, that lead is a poison. And we've known that for over two centuries. Most of the research I've been doing over the past 25 years was to find out how much lead is too much. Now I want you to imagine if you were asked to figure out if aircraft emissions contributed to the amount of lead circulating in the blood of children who live near the airport, how would you go about to do that? You've already got some clues, obviously, by what uh, Sammy just did, but this is really a challenging task. You'd need to know how close children live to the airport, each child. You need to know the age of the housing where they live, the income of the household where they live, the amount of air traffic or the amount of fuel used and how it varies over time, by season, by month. And you need to know the amount of lead circulating in children's blood and much more. And you also need to be able to protect the privacy of children and their families. So this is a challenging study, but it's, there's more. On top of that, you need to find ways to prove or disprove that aircraft emissions were a source of children's exposure to a toxic metal, when other sources like lead and house paint can contribute. So what, what Dr. Zoran and Dr. Keyes and their team did was really quite remarkable. They merged a series of databases, including birth certificates and blood lead tests and flight data and housing records and much more. And as you saw from the presentation, they did a masterful job testing whether their hypothesis was right or wrong. I'm not gonna go over those results. I think Sammy presented them very clearly, very carefully, each one, and he summarized them. I would say though that their report is one of the most thorough and conclusive reports I've read in my 25 year career. And in the end, the results all point to the same conclusion. The Reed Hill View Airport endangers the lives of people who live around the airport, but especially children. Dear Dr. Saran and Deputy County Executive Silvia Gallegos. So at this point, we'd like to open it up for questions. As I mentioned at the beginning of this press event, all the questions must be submitted electronically. So if you hover your mouse over the screen, you're gonna see the Q&A box. Please type your question and we will get an answer for you. At this point, there are no questions. So while reporters decide whether or not they wanna ask something, I'd like to ask Dr. Zoran if he could repeat on camera what he mentioned about the three risk orbits. Um, the presentation was um, being shown during the time that you talked about it. So if you could say it and be on camera in case there's any news outlet that wants to have your face, would you narrate that, please? Go ahead. Yes. So based on previous research uh, showing that the blood lead levels increase substantially among children within 500 meters to a kilometer of the airport, uh, an EPA study published recently uh, modeling the risk and indicating that the that uh, children within 500 meters are most at risk of presenting with higher blood lead levels. And our work uh, on the state of Michigan showing that the risk extends to about a kilometer, that motivated our decision to define that inner orbit of risk as less than a half mile from the airport. And then we move out in equal intervals from a half mile to a mile and from a mile to 1.5 miles. Importantly, the demographic characteristics of the children at each orbit are statistically similar. So we are doing apples to apples comparisons with respect to the age of the children, with respect to the gender of the children, and where we do find differences between uh, these uh, across these risk orbits, uh, like for instance, the quanti the percentage of the housing stock built prior to 1960, we find that the housing stock is older in the outer orbits. That tells us that whatever differences we do find in blood lead levels across the risk orbits, those differences are likely to be conservative, attenuated by the higher risk of these other factors that obtain in outer orbits. Thank you, Dr. Saran. We have a question from Kevin Forestieri. 
He asks, to what extent were blood lead levels measured among children around other airports in Santa Clara County? And were there any noteworthy differences between Reed Hillview and the others? He says he's particularly interested in Moffett Field, which serves military aircrafts and operates substantially different from Reed Hillview. That's an excellent question. I mean, we set out to study the blood lead levels of children um, around San Martin. Um, and we were disappointed to learn that only 68 children were sampled over a 10 year period proximate to the airport. So it's not possible to say anything credible. I mean, I could give you the average blood lead level of children around San Martin, and it is about 20 to 25% lower than what we observe uh, among similarly proximate children by Reed Hillview. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, extending to other airports, I would caution against generalizing from what we've accomplished in this study. Uh, each airport is different in terms of the volume of traffic and the proximity of neighborhoods. I think it's, uh, it would be um, important to perform analyses at these other airports to account for the idiosyncratic uh, factors that obtain at those other airports. And so to answer your question, unfortunately, we weren't able to do separate analyses pertaining to these other airports because of the paucity of data. Okay. Thank you. Jana Katsuyama asked, is there an estimate on how many children in Santa Clara County have lead poisoning because of Reed Hillview Airport? That's a good question. I mean, our analysis was limited to children within this mile and a half orbit. Um, and so we didn't um, you know, comb through all of the other data available to us elsewhere in the County of Santa Clara. What I can tell you is that uh, the decision to study children 18 years of age and under, children from six to 18, um, had the effect of attenuating the observed blood lead levels. So uh, if you restrict the analysis, for instance, uh, to children 12 to 24 months of age, uh, the risk of supersedence of this uh, 4.5 microgram per deciliter threshold um, is around 4% of all such children, those children, again, proximate to the airport. Um, I don't have the statistic uh, for the fraction that obtains countywide. Thank you. And my apologies that that might have been Jana Kata from Bay City News, not Jana from KTVU. We have another question from Patrick McGarity. He asks, for an individual family concerned, is the direction of wind or, dis or distance from the airport the biggest factor, i.e., would living downwind at over one mile be worse than living upwind at less than half a mile? I mean, that's an outstanding question, and that's a question that Dr. Lamphere posed to me. Uh, nowhere in the study, with the exception of the interaction between distance and traffic, do we pursue the question of cumulative risk. Uh, we did perform some analyses on request from Bruce. And uh, Bruce, uh, if you like, you could share what we've learned. Well, um, let, me, let me include the question from Jana as well. Um, I think the first question Jana asked about what percent of kids were lead poisoned. And the first thing you have to do, of course, is define lead poisoning. Uh, California right now uses 4.5 microgram per deciliter. What does that mean? Well, 4.5 microgram per deciliter is equivalent to about 45 parts per billion of lead in blood. Um, and I use part per billion just as a way to help people think about that. Uh, two tablespoons of sugar in an Olympic sized swimming pool is equivalent to one part per billion. So just to give you some sense of scope. So 4.5 microgram per deciliter is what they used. Um, the CDC, I was on a working group recently that just uh, uh, unanimously uh, voted to lower the blood lead reference value, which is used as a uh, definition of lead poisoning today. 
down to 3.5. And so one of the most important things to think about is how are we defining lead poisoning? So what Sammy just said, using 4.5, we'll underestimate it based upon our new understanding. And even then 3.5 is really just arbitrary. So one of the things that Sammy mentioned that we did, we tried to look at toddlers, 12 to 24 month old children. Because if you think about children as, uh, maybe imagine them as vacuum cleaners, right? You know, all the way from being a toddler up to 18 years of age. Toddlers are much better at being vacuum cleaners than any other age group. So if we really wanted to find out uh, and estimate the exposure, the ongoing exposure, we'd look at those vacuum cleaners that are toddlers, two, one, to, one to two year old kids. And in that group, when we look at the incremental increase in these different risk factors that Sammy's described, proximity to the airport, uh, wind direction, what we see is uh, that the increase is going to be over 10% of kids who ultimately have a blood lead greater than 4.5 microgram per deciliter or 45 parts per billion. For the 12 to 24 month olds, we don't have that calculated, but we plan to by next week it's gonna be higher because those toddlers are better indicators of ongoing exposure. The other thing just to point out, and we'll talk more about this next week is there's a couple other ways that we may have underestimated that the, that the study may have underestimated the impact on children. For example, blood lead concentrations were the, the kind of measure available and it's the kind of measure I've used in all my studies, but we know it's not giving us a chronic measure of exposure, a cumulative measure of exposure. It's more of a short-term snapshot. If you think about it as measuring somebody's monthly salary as an estimate of their overall wealth, that's kind of what blood lead is doing. And overall wealth is gonna be measured in bone. And so using blood lead, Sammy and Chris and their team clearly showed that the airport is a major source of lead exposure for these kids. But they also recognize that it's an underestimate because we didn't have measures of bone lead, which is more of a research tool. Thank you, Dr. Lanfear. So the next question uh, comes from Fatima Navarrete with Telemundo. And she asks, would it be possible to get a comment in Spanish? We'd like to know what are the next steps. So I will answer that in Espanol. Uh, for the record, los próximos pasos consisten en dos reuniones comunitarias. La primera va a ser el miércoles 11 de agosto en el este de San José a las 6 de la tarde. La segunda es en el sur del condado. Eh, va a ser en el 12 de agosto también a las 6 de la tarde. Ambas reuniones se van a llevar a cabo a través de Zoom y van a tener los links para participar todas las personas que quieran. Es importante recalcar que en las reuniones va a haber traducción simultánea al español y al vietnamita. Van a estar presentes el doctor Sami Saran y también el doctor Bruce Anfier. So I just gave information about the meetings, community meetings that will take place in Spanish, Vietnamese and English with Dr. Saran and Dr. Lanfier, uh, um, August 11th in East San Jose and August 12th in the South County area. Both meetings will be via Zoom, and I hope everybody can join us if they have more questions for the experts and also uh, for Deputy County Executive Silvia Gallegos. Silvia, is there something you'd like to add about the next steps? I believe this is going to the board as well. That's correct, that um, the decision to uh, receive the report and consider the lead study and what we may do next will be discussed at an evening meeting of the Board of Supervisors on August 17th. Thank you. And we keep getting a couple more answers, rather questions. Jana asks, is the case of Reed Hillview, in the case of Reed Hillview, does lead enter residents' bloodstream because it stays in the air and they breathe it in? Does it impact air quality? Are there other ways lead enters the bloodstream? Sammy, would you like to handle that or you want me to handle that? Um, why don't you take a shot first with respect to uh, routes of exposure? Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, 
the two predominant routes of exposure, how lead gets into children and the rest of us are through ingestion and inhalation. So in the case of airborne lead, children will ingest some, but it will also settle out onto the windowsills, onto the floors of their home, onto the tabletops, and they will ingest it. And that's one of the reasons that toddlers are at greater risk because um, as most of you know, if you have children, uh, children at one to two years of age are becoming more mobile. They crawl, they stand, you know, they might reach up and grab windowsills, but they're also still putting a lot of non-food items into their mouth. And that's why toddlers, is one of the main reasons that toddlers are most vulnerable. So it's a combination of inhalation and ingestion. Thank you. Dr. Lampier, Patrick McGarity wanted an answer from you as well to his question regarding individual family concerns. Uh, is the direction of the wind or the distance from the airport the biggest factor? I don't know if he asked would be, is it worse to live downwind at over one mile or upwind at less than 20 <clears throat> miles? What's the case? Yeah, so I'll have Sammy confirm this. Uh, my understanding, Patrick, and sorry, I didn't get to that part of the question which started this whole thing. Um, the blood lead levels increased uh, to a greater extent if you lived east of the airport, that is downwind uh, on average, than if you lived within uh, a half a mile. That would also imply, of course, that you would expect to see uh, even higher blood lead levels among children who lived downwind and close to the airport. Sammy, is that a fair interpretation? That's probably right. Uh, Patrick, if you, if you contact me by email, I could perform that calculation for you exactly. Um, it's not a calculation that we perform, but um, that and any other combination that you can imagine is something that we can answer. So Patrick, please share your email with us if you want to put it in the Q&A and then we will get you in touch with Dr. Saran. Uh, actually, he has access to, to the Q&A. So. And then there's another question from Jana. She wants to know, what does periods of high airport traffic mean? That's a good question. So, so what we do is we, we take the quantity of traffic observed daily at the airport. And you can imagine you could convert that quantity uh, into a number that ranges from zero to one, like this, the lowest to the highest percentile. Um, and so the results that I communicated to you, imagine movement from that minimum to the maximum level of, of observed traffic at the airport. Thank you. And we have another question from Jana. She wants to know, are there ways that residents can protect themselves from lead poisoning near Reed Hill View? Bruce, may I ask you to take that in terms of the protective action? Yeah. Um, so it's a great question, Jana. Um, to the extent that it's possible to reduce um, airborne particles and dust that settles out in homes, uh, those should help. I, I say should because nobody's ever specifically studied this question. Uh, but one of the first thoughts I had as I was listening to this is, well, should something be done immediately um, until something um, more- Let me, let me step in. Um, sure. Dr. Lanfair. Um, the County of Santa Clara will have a set of recommendations in response to this study and, and these troubling findings, and those will be made available to the public um, late next week. And we'll be happy to discuss this at the board meeting on August 17th. Okay, what, one other uh, quick thought. Um, we've just finished uh, a study. Well, we're still working on it, but we've, we've gotten quite a bit of the evidence coming in. We did a randomized controlled trial of air pollution in pregnant women in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. So we had over 540 pregnant women and half of them received uh, one or two HEPA air cleaners in their home to reduce uh, air pollution. And what we saw was um, in the women who 
were randomly assigned to get the air cleaners. Their babies were a little heavier at birth. That's a good thing. Uh, there were lower rates of wheeze in the two-year-old children. Rates of BMI or obesity were lower in the children whose families were given the air cleaners. And we've got some new studies showing some other potential benefits. So that is one possibility, but it's not been studied specifically looking at airport or lead from uh, air airborne lead. Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A chat, in the Q&A box. So we're gonna wrap it up. We wanna thank Dr. Sami Zaran, Dr. Bruce Lanfear, Deputy County Executive Silvia Gallegos. Remember, we have community events for the public to attend virtually. Uh, East San Jose, dedicated to that community on Wednesday, August 11th at 6 p.m and dedicated to the South County community on Thursday, August 12th, also at 6 p.m. We will disseminate that information repeatedly. We have been sharing it on social media. We hope to get as many people as possible to participate in these community events. There will be simultaneous translation in Spanish and Vietnamese. So with that, we wrap it up for today. Thanks everyone for joining the Office of Communications and Public Affairs at the County of Santa Clara. And don't forget, August 17th, a special meeting of the Board of Supervisors at 6 p.m. to present the findings of the Reed Hillview Airport Airborne Lead Study. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you all.